Welcome to the ups and downs. Now, before we get into the episode this week, we'll just do the usual run through. Remember, of course, that we have our podcast that drops every single Tuesday. The one this week, loads of fun. We had Geek Filter from Twitter on. So make sure that you're subscribed to that one and give us a cheeky little review if you could on the podcast catcher of your choice. Because actually, much like we're asking about the likes, the shares and the subscribes, every one of them makes a difference. Um, and the more you do, the more we can do, the more we all grow together. Speaking of, if you haven't already, click that L subscribe button there. We're actually coming up on 300,000 subscribers. Like that is bonkers. Right, from me to you as a Trekkie, there's 300,000 of us? Podcast every Tuesday and we have our other, so our longer form podcasts as well, which we're aiming to do weekly, depending on the availability of guests. Uh, but we have a very fun one coming up with the amazing Liz Kukowski, who you will know from, you know, bringing us back the bridge of the Enterprise D. That will be dropping in the next few days as well. So I hope you enjoy that one. I guess we should probably discuss this week's episode. It pains my heart to say that we are at episode eight of season four, Caves. Now, what pains my heart is that we've only got two episodes left in season four, which I presume are going to be at least, they're going to lead, it's going to be the finale, uh, whether it's a two-part or not, uh, we don't know yet. So, yeah, but we're nearly there. But what an episode this was. So, the title, and I suppose, ergo, the theme of the episode is my first up of the week. You're thinking, Sean, it's been about 25 minutes. Are you going to give it up? The jokes that like, this is an episode for everyone who ever watched an away mission on planet hell as it got dubbed by the crew. Those exact same ca Mariner says, all these caves look the same every time we go down there because it was the same set all the time. I mean, this is, I love this kind of self-referential humor. You know, caves, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Like, you know, the ongoing jokes in this cold open about, seems like a third of all of our missions are in caves. I love it because it's so, it's so indicative of particularly, pretty much, if I'm honest, everything from the original series right up to, I mean, Discovery's had its share of cave time as well. So like, this is not something that say went the way of the Dodo with Enterprise. So I just love that, like that, that, that my, fir my first up, the fact that, I, and of course, actually, my first up, I'm, I'm assigning to the episode. It's nice and simple, it's just caves. So my second up is how self-aware that is. It's the four, it's the four of them and they're doing a mission again. Cause it's actually been ages since the four of them have done a mission. And it's just fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mariner on the transporter going, I hate cave. Beams down to the planet. Caves. Up. Right, I think that is established. I'm a fan of caves. Um, but of course, much like almost every other single episode of Star Trek that features a cave, there is a slight shuffle which causes some rocks to fall it's funny how unconcerned they look for a second because the rocks fall and you know tendy tries to hail the cerritos and you know mariner just goes of course hundreds of years of technological advancement is stopped by a few rocks up the amount of time that being behind some rocks suddenly the trans uh, the, well, well the transporters and also the communicators just stop working and it's so frustrating. This, like, it's a joke that's been made in Lower Decks before. It's like, you know, oh, look, it wouldn't be a Starfleet mission if there wasn't an issue with comms. I, I, I love it. Is it a repeating joke? Sure it is. It's the deadpan delivery. You know, it's just so much fun. Once all these rocks trap them in this cave, this cave that's going to look like it's doing the rounds, but once they're all trapped in, you know, we've got no source of light except for Go Go Gadget Rutherford. I love, I just, up. I love the face, of course he's got a flashlight in his eye, because why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? It's brilliant. We then learn that this episode is an episode of vignettes. So we get four short stories in this overall larger story. The MacGuffin of the week is a type of moss that they've been sent to study. It turns out to be carnivorous moss and it's going to eat them all, because why not? Sure, why wouldn't you? Listen, it's moss. It's moss in a cave and it's green. Sure, it's going to eat you. It's on you if you didn't notice that. But it's all right, though, because thankfully, thankfully, Rutherford remembers to remove Boimler's pants. 
That's accurate. That is not an exaggeration. Rutherford tells Boimler to take his pants off and he does it. No questions asked. Barry just goes, D really? And he's like, oh, we're roommates. It's fine. Now, the funny thing is that, you know, Rutherford uses it. Uh, it's like we're going to bounce a phaser shot off it, vaporizes the pants, but it also, it releases the mineral in the wall. And Boimler goes, probably could have done that with my shirt. But it leads Boimler into remembering a time he was stuck in a cave with Lieutenant Levy. Now, we've seen Lieutenant Levy before as the conspiracy theory touting Lieutenant walking around the, sh the halls of the Cerritos. This is the one who claimed Wolf 359 was an inside job, which if you want to get technical about it, <laughs> seeing Levy and Boimler together. Now, remember, Levy is a full Lieutenant, whereas Boimler is Lieutenant Junior Grade. So Levy does outrank him and yet, there's very little doubt as to who's actually in charge of this mission. But it is Levy who is getting it up, by the way, because I just thought he was so much fun. Because he's so earnest. That's actually, you know, on that. It's that, yes, his theories are crackpot, as Boimler says, but he seems to be so honest in his weird ideas. And even though he does admit to taking part of a subspace chat room where they make up, uh, I mean, uh, discuss things, which might go against my point of it being honest, it, it does seem to want to be a part of a community. And um, we all know people who, they may not be conspiracy theorists, but they might be the people who will push a rather overt idea just to seem like they're part of the team. Uh, maybe I'm being really kind here. Yeah. Levy suggests that after he and Boimler were trapped in the cave, that Boimler discovers a perfectly functional cave buggy, but it only has one seat, that no, 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 he pulls out his phaser, destroys the buggy and says, that's what the Vendronians want you to think. Take it up. Love seeing animated series characters coming back again. The Vendronians are shape-changing tentacled aliens that first appeared back in the animated series and have actually appeared in Lower Decks before. They appeared in the episode Envoys. And it sets up a really nice thread. Initially, in this segment, it, it seems like another one of Levy's crackpot theories and Boimler's getting increasingly worn out with this. And especially after the buggy is destroyed, Boimler, he loses his mind at him and he starts shouting and it says this is why people don't want to spend time with you you know he says you know you're there making up these theories wolf 359 was a tragedy picard's not a hologram things like that you know and and, and levy this breaks my heart levy his eyes fill up with tears and he goes i just i just wanted to help and i mean like you can't stay angry at someone like that they might still be very bloody wrong but it's hard to stay angry at that. And it's doubly hard to stay angry when it turns out he's absolutely right and two of the rocks transform and they're Vendronians. The Vendronians are like, nah, all right, okay, cool. We're gonna shove you down to this pit. Uh, Levy's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. They're gonna tie us together. They're gonna make us look at each other in the eyes. They're gonna fill our necks with their brood sacks and everything. And the Vendronians go, wait, how did you know that? And you can just see the dawning look on Boimler's face. He's like, Oh my God, Levy actually knew what he was talking about. And, but the problem is you could also see Levy going, Oh my God, I was actually right. And it just leads to, they become like honored guests at a Vendronian banquet. It is a bonkers little vignette. And it's an up. Back in the present, Boimler has finished recounting his story and kind of says, you know, Levy's, Levy's all right. You know, kind of like, you know, he's, they've hung out a few times on the holodeck. And Tendy, Rutherford and Mariner go, excuse me? You... You hung out with someone who isn't us. That's a thread that will come back. As they're scanning the caves, Rutherford just says, oh, you know, like that time me and Tana had a baby in the caves. And I mean, come on, how did he expect them to react by just dropping that little nugget? If I'm there in the office and, you know, myself, Ellie and Chris are chatting around, oh, no, 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 and Chris is like, hey, it's, it's like that time me and Simon Miller had a baby there in the uh, canteen. I'd be like, sorry, you might want to expand on that one. And so thankfully Rutherford does. He recounts a time that he and Ta'ana were trapped in a cave, automatically up. Because we get a good chunk of Ta'ana in this episode, which is a lot of fun because you don't get, a lot of the time she'll just be 
kind of a, a wise cracking character in like the side of a scene and you know she smashes it and a lot of the time those type of characters don't translate well over into having the spotlight shown on them too much of a good thing i think a good example of that might be johnny depp's captain jack sparrow as the films go on you realize that it worked best alongside other characters as opposed to taking the center stage thankfully works perfectly here. Rutherford and Tana are there, they are attempting to source ferns, they go and they pick one up and the next thing, oh my god, their guide is impaled on a rock, she's touched Rutherford's face and he's now heavily pregnant. As you do. Star Trek my friends, Star Trek. Tana gives him a boot to chew on and you know she pulls out a laser scalpel and it's all getting very, no thank you, and so uh yeah she opens Rutherford and their little clown baby is born. As we sort of knew he would be, Rutherford's a very good dad. Or maybe it's because of what he learned by not being the best dad to Badgie. Oh, connection, connection, connection. But yes, we get, you know, that lovely scene of, you know, Rutherford's really good babysitter and, you know, to Anna, who is, you know, a, a doctor is supposed to be so caring and so just couldn't gave less of a crap in the beginning. She's like, yeah, you do the babysitting. I'm going to go check the caves and see how to get out of here. Off away she goes, marking the caves as she goes. But as this happens, and we're sort of led to believe that this is certainly over the course of a few hours anyway. And, you know, she starts to see Rutherford's getting on very well with their clown baby. You know, you see, you see different pitches of to Anna. You know, you get your normal gruff to Anna, but then also that kind of sweeter gruff to Anna and I'm sorry I'm sure every person who's ever changed a nappy ever wants to phaser it into non-existence taken up but yeah doctor and engineer come together to help keep this baby safe and even interact with the cave monster because Rutherford's able to jury rig his tricorder to be a universal translator and hey presto they all escape together everyone's happy out and back in the present they're like you think you would have mentioned you had a child with Anna like you think you would have I, I might go, Matt. You know, and Tendy keeps going. You know, it, it, it still reminds me of that time with the turbolift. And of course, they're all telling her, we don't care about the turbolift, it wasn't a cave. Gee, I wonder if that's going to become important later on. The time does then come for Mariner's vignette and the shocking revelation that she once led a Delta Shift away mission to a cave. <gasps> Now, in typical Mariner style, she doesn't so much lead them to a cave as she does take the shuttle and ram it into a cave. I mean, it's Mariner, like, what else are you expecting? You know what I mean? And, you know, then then we have this interaction between, you know, she's a, it's, it's with the Delta Shift version of our Lower Deckers. I mean, their Rutherford has an eye patch and a scar and their Boimler has injuries, so many injuries, and it works. You know, this, this cave, the MacGuffin is, there is a rock that they need materials from, so they walk toward the rock and it starts to age them. Oh God, it feels like after a whole day of doing ups and downs. I'm kidding. It's, it's well balanced because, you know, you could have that like, you know, oh, come on, like, you know, we get it, you know, you're, you're, and it's not, it, it's well balanced because it always seems to come from a place of, it's not petty. Or even if it is petty, it's not petty petty. I'm giving myself an up for that one. But you get this understanding because if nothing else, they want to figure everything out and escape. And unfortunately, Mariner is too old to make it toward the rock. And so uh, the other ensign starts to walk. But of course, he's got a broken leg, which heals wrong. And then his leg falls off. It's a bit of a gruesome scene, um, but in typical Star Trek fine, it's absolutely hilarious. Once they find the other rock that makes them younger, everyone's fine. But they do then engage in a Delta shift, Delta shift. You know, because Mariner starts to see, it's like, okay, I can understand why the night shift might hate us because we break stuff and you have to clean it up during the day. But then they counter with, yeah, but you get seen. We never get seen. You know, she says, I've seen Captain Freeman maybe four or five times, Ransom maybe three or four but because your beta shift and you get noticed, it means you get picked for the promotions because they see what you do. And it's a really good point. It's literally a case of, it's not that one is working particularly harder than the other. It's that one is doing that around the corner. And I think we've all been in a situation where deliberate or no, 
we have felt that that's how we've been seen or that's how we've been interpreted. So yeah, it's, I like this. I like this understanding. Uh, and of course, back in the present, you have Rutherford, Boimler and Tendi, you're like, you cheered with Delta Shift? Judas. Up. We eventually get this turbo lift story because the moss completely takes over the four of them, pins them against a wall, but the moss, of course, is sentient and says, I want to hear what the green one has to say. And finally, Tendi gets to tell her story. It looks like this is footage that's actually been lifted from Second Contact. Because if you look at even, even the style of the animation on the Cerritos is a little bit... When I say rougher, I just mean that it's been refined since. Which I guess is the definition of rougher. It's so cool. And Tendi's just re remembering they had their drinking session after the end of the events, which they did, and they ended up in a turbo lift and it gets stuck. So they end up getting to know each other. You know, they end up playing like kind of a basketball with socks and, you know, they kind of tell stories and they just kind of like, they kind of sleep on each other. And it's bonding and it's so cute. And it's a def definitely an up for me. Um, but the fact that it's what sticks in Tendi's mind, that's what she thinks of first when she thinks of the Lower Deckers. That's my Latinum up of the week. It might be a little simple one, I know, but I just really, really like that. Also, I liked the bit when Shaq's, you know, kind of bursts in the door and they accidentally wet themselves again. It's, it look, I'm a simple man, but I like it. That's enough for the moss to kind of pull back and go, actually, you guys are all right. And they make contact with the Cerritos and everything's fine. And, and of course, it's all revealed to be a Vendronian morality tale. And the morality test is an up as well. And I'll get to why that's an up in Cetacean Observations. Now, we've mentioned, obviously, the caves of it all already. For example, I feel like I've been in this cave a thousand times. Makes absolutely perfect sense. Bunch of rocks beating centuries of technological uh, evolution. Much like every other time they're in a cave in Star Trek. We get the return of Lieutenant Levy, our conspiracy theorist. We get Vendorians from the animated series. Boimler dons a wrist flashlight that we've seen so many times in Star Trek before. Turns out the Vendorian homeworld is in the Beta Quadrant. Vendorians are shapeshifters. We have seen that before as well. Play right into their tentacles. The morality test. Gene Roddenberry imagined that every episode of the original series, at least of Star Trek, would be a morality play. That basically your characters are given a scenario in which they need to make the right choice to make it to the end. And it was Nichelle Nichols who correctly identified this and discussed this with Gene Roddenberry. So having that morality be a part of the Vendorian's plan, I really, really like that. Uh, we talk about how Wolf 359 was a tragedy. Q does exist. Picard isn't a hologram, but the Voyager's EMH is a hologram, the clue being in the name. Not so much a Easter egg as the Vendorians are voiced by Don Lewis, Fred Tadashior. You know, like, I noticed. I noticed. So Levy believes that via his subspace chat room, the Vendorians are responsible for all sorts of things. Like, for example, obelisks. Vendorians do obelisks. And we've seen our fair few obelisks in our time in Star Trek. Uh, going to warp speed damages subspace being a rumor the Vendorians started. Bit of a callback to force of nature there. We then have... <laughs> Sorry. Your theories are quite close to the truth. We did not, however, do the Klingon Civil War, as you put it. Mariner, of course, after this is a bit shocked and horrified that Boiner would spend time with people who think that we're in the mirror universe. Don't read the news. Delta Shift makes its return. Delta, what the fuck with this eye patch? Sorry. They talk about chronotons, which of course are endemic in Star Trek. Um, that spells Targ. Love it. Is it an isolinear, uh, isolinear optical chip? You got it on the second guess. Love it. Just sorry. Endorious. Love it. So you might be like, John, we waited the whole thing and there's no downs. Look, I'm not going to say this is the greatest episode of Lower Decks that was ever aired, but what this was, was pleasantly simple. And, you know, we, we, were, we were discussing this before we started recording, going like, you know, do we have any downs? And we both went, myself and Chris, we went, well, you, you could say lack of Tallinn, but it's not a down, especially when you think of this weekend at New York Comic Con, Alex Kurtzman and Mike McMahon took to the stage and they, you know, they both confirmed, yep, season five is going to have a lot of Tallinn in it. 
so, I mean, I would really be splitting hairs trying to, you know, I'm so happy about that. So yeah, I've no downs this week. Um, feels odd, but it's happy odd. So what did you think? Let us know in the comments below. Let us know over on the socials. We're on Twitter at Trek Culture. We're on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. We're on Blue Sky at Trek Culture. I'm at Sean Ferrick. And of course you can get at Edit Chris Edit on the various socials as well. As I say, please folks, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We're getting this much closer to 300,000. Everyone, please, please look after yourself. Um, please lead with kindness. Please, we are in a very dangerous time when it comes to information at the moment. Um, please make sure not to trust the first headline you read. That's all I will say. Um, it's uh, th There's a lot of, lot of confusion in the air at these times. So let's, let's all remember to take a second and breathe. Um, make sure, of course, you live long and prosper. Our friends in Ukraine, Slava Ukraina, our friends in the Middle East, we you know we are absolutely just. We hope for safety, we hope for peace, and that's what we want to put across as a channel. And I personally want to put that across as well. I'm hoping for peace. Everyone, look after yourselves. So I'm talking to you again. Make sure that you have a wonderful week. Make it so. <laughs>